and welcome to the journal webinar series of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. This series features the latest research published in our society journals. I'm Matt Nilsen with the journal Crop Forage and Turfgrass Management, also known as CFTM. I want to thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar addressing the question, does crop planting order impact farm profit? Before we begin, I'd like to mention that questions can be entered into the Q&A section. And the moderator will address them at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be emailed to all attendees after the session. Happy to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Laura Lindsay. She's the technical editor of the journal CFTM. Dr. Lindsay is the soybean and small grain extension specialist in the Department of Horticulture and crop science at the Ohio State University. Laura? Yep. Uh, thank you, um, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is a topic I'm extremely interested in, so I'm, I'm happy to be moderating uh, this webinar. Um, as Matt mentioned earlier, uh, please enter uh, questions in the chat box and we'll address them at the end of our presentation. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, uh, Dr. Spiros Marzinius, and Dr. Sean Conley. Um, Dr. Morzinas is an agricultural data scientist. His research interests include information extraction from messy and disconnected agricultural and environmental data sets using statistical modeling, machine learning algorithms, and data science. He is a developer of AgroOptimizer, a cloud-based web application that allows U.S. farmers to optimize their corn and soybean cropping system for maximum profit. I also want to introduce uh, Dr. Sean Conley. Uh, he is a professor in the state soybean and small grain specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research goal is to generate science-based solutions to address real-world problems in soybean and small grain production. Uh, this knowledge is then integrated and delivered through ex his extension program. Dr. Conley has authored or co-authored 144 journal articles and has spoken at over 800 events to nearly 65,000 clients since beginning his academic career. His commitment to agriculture in, the, in Wisconsin has led him to co-author a children's book entitled Cool Bean, the Soybean. Uh, today, they will be discussing how gross farm revenue can be affected by crop planting order, corn first, soybean second, and vice versa. The research was published in the 2023 volume of uh, CFTM. So welcome to both of you. Uh, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, today, uh, Spiros and I will be talking about um, corn and soybean planting order decisions and how this impacts farm gross revenue. And I think probably if we would have brought this forward about 10 years ago, this would have really been a no decision for most farmers. They'd say, well, clearly we plant our corn first. And then we move into our soybean and kind of finish this off depending on the weather. But some of the work that we've done over the last decade, I think, might um, might throw a little bit of a monkey wrench into that initial thought. So <clears throat> today we're to kind of walk through some of our, our, our work on this topic. And before I get started, I always want to thank the Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board. The Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board funds roughly about 80% of my research program. And uh, this is kind of work due to uh, check off dollars, not just in Wisconsin, but also the North Central Soybean Research Program. So as we get started here, we'll kind of jump right in. Maybe. All right, so I think we've all realized that we've seen some um, pretty significant uh, weather related changes over the last 20 to 30 years. And I don't really like to get you know, bogged down in the red versus blue idea of this is um, climate change or not. But basically, I think we can all say we've seen more extreme weather events and we've seen an impact not just on our corn yields, but also our soybean yields. And this is some work in, that Sparrows and I did roughly a decade ago, and I can't believe it's that old already, but kind of show of what this changing weather, these extreme weather events can, can do across the north central region in terms of a, yield loss and this doesn't really take into effect you know soybean yield gain over time which we know is roughly 0.3 bushels per acre per year that's the genetic yield gain but some of the values we see here on the left in figure one kind of shows what we're adding for example in wisconsin we're adding roughly 0.26 bushels 
per acre per year just due to changing weather in terms of having a longer growing season and just the climate uh, relationships that kind of will increase our soybean yield. So I think that's the framework we're understanding here is first of all, we've seen weather changes and this has led us to, to managing our soybean crop in a different manner. Um, just simply taking some of the work that we've done just from NAS data, I think every state here represented will get these reports on a weekly basis, kind of showing what the planting progress is. And if we just look here on the left-hand side, we can see just Wisconsin yield um, and the relationship between that and the day of the year where we hit a 50% soybean planting progress within that state. And just looking at you know, that broad stroke across the entire state of Wisconsin, we see roughly gaining almost a half a bushel per acre per day from yield gains just by planting earlier. And I think this what has allowed us and our science for success team across the United States is to redo and work with RMA to update our replant coverage maps. And I think in Wisconsin here and among the many parts of the Midwest are shown in this figure, we see a lot of changes and we've seen um, basically changing that map up to 10 days earlier in Wisconsin and we get down to some more of the southern areas. We've seen a whole month earlier in terms of when that replant coverage would come in through RMA and crop insurance. So I think we've seen this more at a at this uh, macro level. But we really kind of want to take some time and dig into this initially and look at what this really means on the soybean yield in terms of across the north, the north central region. So this is some data that we collected through funding through our North Central Soybean Research Program, our benchmarking project, where we surveyed, surveyed over 8,000 farm fields across the Midwest, and we collected over 600,000 acres worth of data. So it's a pretty huge data set, really trying to hone in on what we see. And if we do a simple random forest or machine learning um, algorithm, not really an algorithm, but um, statistical analysis here, we see by far and away that one of the biggest things or predictors of yield is planting date. And here we're kind of referred to as sowing date. But again, we see, you know, planting date is a huge driver in soybean yield and how that really relation to, uh, relates to that planting day in soybean versus corn. And I think one of the things we've seen across the North Central region is we've seen anywhere from almost three bushels per acre per week um, yield loss by delaying planting past roughly April 15th, all the way down to roughly 1.5. So we see a huge range in that relationship between planting date and yield on the soybean side. Now, I think one of the things we also have to realize is that we don't automatically get that yield. A lot of this is basically like we plant early, it sets that soybean crop up for maximizing yield. However, weather conditions in this case, it's um, a water balance during or the amount of available water during pot field really kind of drives us. So if we look at this fact that we're really pushing farmers to plant early um, on, the, on the soybean side of things to be able to maximize their yield potential, how does this really relate to our work and trying to manage the entire corn soybean production system. We roughly see 180 million acres of that system across the North Central region. So the goal of this work was really trying to kind of hone in and focus in on can farmers make some educated decisions or choices upon which crop to start planting earlier based on some of the new work that we've seen as the significant yield increases with driving our soybean plantings earlier. So with that, I'm going to pause here. I'm going to switch it over to um, Sparrows, and Sparrows can do, you know, kind of talk about the statistics and some of the work we've done with that. Well, thank you, Sean. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Well, it appears that there are no studies uh, examining how crop planting order within uh, the same growing season can affect yield of corn and soybean and the total gross farm revenue when we are using different background management and when we have different commodity selling prices. So this was our goal, to evaluate the effect of these factors on gross farm revenue. So we used uh, algorithms that we developed in a previous uh, study uh, from databases that uh, included yield management and weather data for both crops, corn and soybean, across the United States. And here you can see the location of these trials. 
uh, we have a pretty good coverage of uh, the entire uh, region that most of the corn and soybean is grown. Uh, so these algorithms were machine learning algorithms uh, to uh, predict corn uh, yield to the left and soybean yield to the right. And here you can see the agreement of actual versus predicted corn and soybean yield in a test data set. Uh, and you can see the high degree of accuracy uh, with a very high R squared values and low root mean square errors. So this uh, made us feel more confident uh, about uh, the results of the R simulations. So using these algorithms, uh, we estimated yield trends due to multiple planting dates uh, in the same uh, environment. Uh, that's a combination of soil type and weather conditions for both crops across 310 locations in 26 states. And here in the map uh, to the right, you can see uh, the locations. And in each location, we use two maturities for corn, 105 and 115 uh, days. And for soybean, uh, you can see the average maturity uh, in each state with a different color, uh, from uh, yellow to red for uh, late uh, early to late maturities. And in Wisconsin, you can uh, see a blue star, and that shows the location of a, a randomly chosen field. That I'm, I'm going to show you some site-specific results uh, that, of course, uh, we did the same analysis in every location, but I'm just going to focus in one location uh, for demonstration purposes. And we also assume different management decisions, a typical and a low input cropping system for corn and soybean. Uh, the typical corn cropping system had 33,000 seeds per acre seeding rate and 160 pounds of, uh, per acre of nitrogen. And the low input had 26,000 seeds per acre and 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen rate. And for soybean, the typical uh, system had 140,000 seeds per acre and the low input uh, system 90,000 seeds per acre. Uh, and now a few assumptions for the partial economic analysis. Uh, we had to assume uh, the uh, corn and soybean prices, 5.1 and 12.2 bushels dollar per bushel, respectively. Uh, the soybean seed cost was set to $65 uh, dollars per 140,000 seeds. And for corn, the seed cost was set to $300 dollars per 80,000 seeds. And nitrogen cost was set to $1 dollar per pound. And then in each location, we assumed that there, was, there were 5,000 acres of farmland. And to simplify things, we assumed uh, 2,500 acres for each crop and a planting capacity uh, for both crops of 250 acres per day. Now, let's see in that randomly chosen field in Wisconsin, uh, the yield trends for both uh, crops, corn and soybean. Uh, when using uh, typical cropping systems for both crops. Here in the graph, uh, we can see uh, corn uh, with a blue line and the soybean uh, yield trend with an orange line. Uh, corn yield uh, is shown to the, uh, the left y-axis and soybean yield to the right y-axis. And we can see that for both crops, uh, delayed planting uh, resulted uh, in uh, yield penalties, uh, lower yields especially after planting date uh, uh, 120 day of year that's late april early may uh, and then when examining the yield trends due to uh, delayed planting but for typical soybean system but low input corn cropping system uh, we can see the difference here look at the blue line uh, lower yield and also different yield trend then when examining the low input soybean system this time, but typical corn cropping system, uh, well, for soybean, we do not see a huge difference from typical cropping system, probably because soybean is a pretty resilient crop and uh, the yield difference is not very obvious, even when using 90,000 seeds per acre compared to 140. And then finally, uh, these are the yield trends when using low input cropping systems for both crops. So what we see here, uh, is that, of course, management matters in terms of maximum yield, but also uh, the yield trends due to delayed planting. All these things vary due to different management systems. And now, having these in mind, these yield trends in mind, let's see uh, the gross farm revenue. Corn plus soybean acres, the entire farmland uh, in that randomly chosen field in Wisconsin, uh, when planting corn acres first and then soybean, over planting soybean acres first and then corn for every planting date. Again, 
starting from typical cropping systems for both crops. Here we can see the vertical line at one, that's the corn and soybean revenue ratio, planting first corn over, uh, over plant first soybean. So for the first 10 days of the planting season that we examined, that's 100, 110, that's uh, April 10th to April 20th, it appears that planting soybean first should be prioritized for maximum profit. Uh, and then after April 20th, uh, corn should be prioritized uh, over soybean. Then, when we're using typical soybean system but low input corn cropping system, the day that uh, corn should be prioritized over soybean moved to late April. Then, when using low input soybean system and typical corn cropping system, the results were pretty similar when using typical cropping systems for both crops. And I remind you the previous graph with the yield trends that there was not a huge difference when using low input uh, cropping system for soybean versus typical. And then when using low input cropping systems for both crops, again, it appears that uh, soybean uh, planting should be prioritized uh, up to late April. And then after late April, corn should be prioritized for the rest of the planting season. So here we can see how uh, management systems uh, affect, we show how they affect yield and yield trends due to delayed planting, but also how they affect uh, choices of uh, uh, which uh, crops should be planted first. Then we repeated the same analysis in uh, every location, uh, the 310 locations across the United States, and we tried to identify the day of year uh, that core planting should be prioritized over soybean planting for maximum cross farm revenue. And here uh, you can see uh, in this panel uh, the cropping systems, both crops low input uh, or typical input, uh, etc. And uh, what I want to focus here, what I want to focus is that uh, when corn cropping systems were typical, uh, corn should be prioritized early in the growing season in almost every state. Uh, so this shows that corn revenue is more sensitive to management decisions than soybean revenue. And of course, we saw that because it connects with yield. And overall, uh, as a general conclusion, is that planting order decisions should always incorporate management optimization because management practices matters and affect the results. Of course, this was, I would say, a simple scenario, having just two fields, one will be planted with corn and another one with soybean. Uh, in a real-life scenario, farmers would have more, more fields and it would be much more complicated. And that's why I believe that we need decision support tools to help us uh, with these kind of calculations. And as an example here, I will show you a hypothetical scenario. Again, uh, in Arlington, Wisconsin, uh, we assume that there is a farmer with four fields, north, south, east and west, to be planted with corn in the north with 500 acres and production cost of $990 per acre. And you can see the uh, numbers for the rest of the fields. Uh, these production costs uh, include everything from rent to seed cost and fertilizer, etc. Uh, and you can see that the fields are, uh, they do not have equal sizes. And this farmer, uh, uh, some assumptions actually, uh, there, we assumed a planting capacity of 100 acres uh, per day. And, Corn price $5 per bushel and soybean price $13 per bushel. And the farmer says that typically the target planting date every year, if weather allows, of course, is April 30th to start with one of these four fields and then uh, the second, the third, and finally the fourth field will follow. So the question is where do we start? Which field should we start? Uh, so a decision support tool can uh, run all the possible scenarios and do all the calculations and within seconds will result in a graph like this. So here we can see all planting sequences uh, in descending total revenue, that's sum of all fields. Uh, we can see at, uh, at the top uh, with a black bar, that's the planting sequence uh, with the greatest uh, profit potential. And almost all the way to the bottom with a uh, red bar, that's the typical planting order. And we can see that there is uh, a large difference in potential uh, total revenue. 
And just to complicate things a little bit more, let's assume that something happens. And now uh, we couldn't plant on April 30th due to uh, heavy rainfall, I would say. And now the new target planting date is May 10th. Then again, we run the simulations and these are the new results. And here we can see that now many, almost half of the planting sequences would result in even negative total revenue. Uh, that means that for some of these planting sequences, the farmer might even lose money. Uh, why? Uh, well, because we know that there is a, a yield penalty due to delayed planting. We saw the yield curves. Uh, so especially for the last couple of fields, the, the yield penalty is going to be pretty significant, but the production costs stay the same. Uh, however, still, it appears that there are a few uh, planting sequences that they may uh, result in uh, positive and uh, significant uh, uh, positive uh, total revenue. So this shows overall that, uh, how, that first of all, management optimization is an important uh, part uh, of in these calculations. Uh, and how complicated all this system is. Uh, that's why I strongly believe that we need decision support tools to, uh, to run all these estimations and calculations and provide some guidance of which planting sequence might work better in each individual environment. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your presentations. Um, as a reminder, if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to, to type them in the chat box now. While you guys are getting your fingers warmed up to type, I can uh, I can come up with a question. So, um, Sean, what are, what are some of the agronomic reasonings behind um, planting order decisions? Good question, Laura. So I think one of the first things we have to understand <clears throat> is that you know breeders and agronomists have made some pretty significant improvements in maximizing soybean yield over the last 30 years. Uh, one thing is that soybean breeders have effectively selected for today's modern high genetics. There's actually um, half the yield penalty we will get now versus 30 years ago for a low stand. And what I mean by that is breeders have, through their selection process, picked varieties that branch more and have putting three times the yield on. So why does that matter for us? We know if we're planting early into harsh conditions, there's a pretty significant, depending on the year, uh, chance we might have some stand loss. Let's say we drop a, a unit to 140,000 seeds per acre, and we have a weather event come through, some soil crusting, and we're only getting 90,000 plants up out of that 140,000 we, um, we planted. We can still get almost, if not 100% yield potential on that st stand where we've lost roughly a third. You try doing that with corn, and if you lose a third of your corn stand, um, we're really not gonna see that. So I think that's one of the things we've seen on the agronomic side is just the whole effect where breeders and agronomy have intersected and shown that the yield penalty for a thin stand is half of what it, yield be, what, what it used to be. And also, one of the interesting things is that we've actually seen a synergistic effect with um, today's modern genetics by, playing, by planting earlier. So we actually see a higher yield gain on, a, on an annual basis than we would have uh, with older genetics by planting earlier. So I think we're seeing this, this interaction occurring between the two that really kind of helps push and drive that, you know, that soybean um, earlier in order to be able to can take up for a poor stand. And also we under, understand that, um, you know, I know I've worked with you a lot on this, Laura, and, and others across the country is that we're getting more seeds per unit area by planting earlier. That's what's driving this free yield, if you will. And that's what really helps us compensate and allow us to drive this, this yield. And we're not really capturing that as much on the corn side. So I think those are two caveats we've seen, at least on what's really driving the soybean planting, maybe in some areas before we even start turning the, the wheel on planting corn. Mm -hmm. And we've had similar observations where we plant really early and sometimes we're lucky if we get that 90 or 80, sometimes we're down to 50,000 plants per acre, but then through branching and other miracles, it yields about the same. So soybeans are a, a remarkable crop. So. Um, so here's a question um, from, from the group here. Uh, what is the status of the decision support tool? Created coming soon 
or maybe someday? Well, okay, uh, it's already online, uh, but still under development. Uh, for these specific calculations, uh, it should be ready and up running uh, in maybe mid-February. Well, I keep saying that, but I keep pushing that date back. But anyway, it should be it should be there in uh, about uh, mid-February. But the decision support tool is already online. So another question from the audience: uh, Does this calculation take into account soil fertility differences? Yes, the, especially the new algorithms. Uh, yes, uh, they can uh, take uh, uh, soil type, of course, and pH and uh, uh, phosphorus and potassium levels. I'm going to pause a moment to see if there's any more questions coming. I guess I have one uh, for, for you, Sean, specifically. Um, are you seeing a generational shift in planting order decisions? Um, I feel like older farmers are more inclined to plant corn first, but maybe some of the newer or younger farmers are more inclined to, to try soybeans. Are you seeing any of that? And this is all anecdotal. I've not done any formal survey, but anecdotal just from talking to people. I would agree with that. I think what we've what we've seen is, and again, this is my anecdotal evidence as well as those that I interact with, and probably you do as well, Laura, on Twitter. Our general younger generations are the ones, you know, tagging me when they're out there planting on April seventh here in Wisconsin, and they're kind of follow. I follow them through the growing season. They kind of report back to me with yields. And I think there's some foundational knowledge and information that's that is i don't want to say it's wrong it's maybe just inaccurate and i think the earliest one is when you know when do we start planting soybeans based on soil temperature and you know historically what we've done and when a lot of this early physiology work was done in the late 60s and early 70s where we determined what the threshold base temperature was for germination and emergence for corn was 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I think we've all worked that out. It's what everyone uses. And we really didn't work that out on the soybean side as, as intensely because 30 years ago, 40 years ago now, uh, when this fun foundational work was done, we were planting soybeans in June. I think if we go in and we dig into the literature, we find that that base temperature or critical threshold temperature for germination and emergence for soybean is less than 50. I, I think there's some play there. It's roughly somewhere probably between 44 and 48, just depending on who has done the work. But I think if you understand that, that actually if you plant soybean earlier into some cooler ground, it will actually start the germination process ahead of soy, uh, ahead of corn just based on the physiology of, of that plant and we also have to understand that uh, when we're planting in a cool weather or cool soils we can get imbibitional chilling in soybean just like you can in corn but it's to a lesser extent and what i mean by that is that window where that plant that soybean seed is subjected to imbibitional chilling is much shorter than it is on corn so i think it gives us a little bit more flexibility there so i think that's some work that many of us have proposed and we're I know I'm, I wrote a proposal with uh, Laura on this call here today or this panel to kind of try to dig into that a little bit deeper because that will really help push and improve our modeling if we can have a more accurate base temp temperature or threshold for germination and emergence in soybean and how that compares to corn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple, a couple more questions for you guys. Um, so is there a map available by state or region that would show the average date which short corn should be prioritized over soybean? Uh, well, we developed a, a map, I think I showed you in one slide, but here I have to note something. Uh, these results are very specific to the specific assumptions that we made about uh, corn selling prices, soybean selling prices, cropping systems. Uh, so this should not be used as a general recommendation because there is no one size fits all in these kind of uh, calculations and simulations. From all my attempts that I tried, even within the same field, different cropping systems and different assumptions about prices, uh, these dates change and sometimes they change a lot. Uh, so unfortunately, 
I, I don't think it's a good idea to generate a map with very general recommendations about this. But there is a map provided in your CFTM article you can reference, but yes, take it with yes. a grain of salt based on the, the assumptions given. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So any evaluation of disease risk considerations? So yes, yeah, so sure. when we do this work, this, this data comes from all of our trials across the United States. If you remember, I think it was the second slide that uh, Spiro showed, this is yield to actual yield data from variety of trials from across the United States. And those disease notes uh, for both corn and soybeans are kind of noted. And it's kind of blended in with, with the background yield potential at those given sites. So I would, it's not that we said this site specifically has Phytophthora or this one has SDS per se, but that's kind of blended into the background information in terms of yield potential based on that site over, over the years of this trial. So I would say, yes, it's in there, but it's kind of hard to parse out and pull out. Yeah, all, all of those caveats, right? Um, so as cover crops are growing in use and popularity, how does managing a cover crop and wanting to get sizable growth for weed control affect soybean planting date? Sure, so I can take a first stab at that. And we actually, Sparrows and I were bouncing back uh, an article or a journal article we we're working on about basically termination timing with, with soybean in terms of cover crop. And for this, for uh, what I'm gonna reference right now, this would be cereal rye. And there's, again, lots of caveats. And I think that those caveats are what keeps us agronomists employed, uh, thankfully, because uh, it was if it was simple, then, uh, I don't know what I would be doing, selling iPhones and now, I guess. So, um, well, first of all, I think one of the things we, as you move further south in climate, and by, by further south, I mean, once you get into mid Illinois south, we tend to see greater biomass accumulation based on corn harvest time, when you can get that rye planted versus when we get into Wisconsin. And we have a real challenge in Wisconsin and, and north of there, getting good um, rye biomass based on the systems we're in. Now, I think there's ways we can tweak that system because currently what farmers are doing are planting of the latest maturity group bean and the latest um, corn hybrids in order to kind of help capture that top end yield. So a lot of that has to be with planting date. Now, I think there are some, cereal rye varieties out there that are, do a better job of greening up earlier and accumulating biomass. So I think that's one part of the, uh, the effort we need to look at is being able to breed new uh, cover crops, be able to accumulate that biomass. So I think the threshold that um, Rodrigo Worley has put here in Wisconsin is you roughly need about 5,000 pounds of biomass. Uh, at termination to influence um, weed competition, all right? So that's our target, is that 5,000. So I think one of the, the work that we kind of be doing now is how do these different varieties respond to this interaction uh, in terms of that competition with cover crops and how late we, can we terminate it. The work that we've done is recently is we can terminate roughly about 10 days or two weeks you know, after planting of soybeans, uh, we still perceive pretty minimum yield loss from that competition um, based on some of the work that we've seen. Uh, the challenge we run into is a year like this year across much of the Midwest, we had a dry, really dry spring. So I think that's another caveat that we need to kind of understand is if we're going into that spring time and we're going in and it's dry, we have to terminate that cover crop early Otherwise, we're going to have a detrimental effect on our, our soybean yield. So again, there's some other caveats to play in here, but that's kind of the interplay that we, that we see. Spiros, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, I, I don't have anything to add. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, a lot of future work that can build off your study quite, quite nicely. Um, so this is another interesting future thought for you guys. Um, will this tool be able to help growers decide if it's profitable to purchase a second planter so you can plant both crops at the same time? Uh, 
Not currently. That complicates things even more. I know. Another, it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great comment and a great question. And actually, it is. Sure. It is. And actually, it is a good idea. Uh, yeah, perhaps that could be an outcome of the calculations. If, okay, how many days actually you can plan faster and how much are you going to increase your profit in how many years in order to purchase the planter, something like that. I haven't thought about it, to be honest, but that, I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've actually thought about this one and I've tried to get our ag economists excited about it. We you know that this is the dairy state and they want to talk about milk all the time. But um, one of the things I've thought about and Spiros alluded to it is because we, we have the calculations down for what the yield penalty is by delayed planting for corn. We got that pretty well sorted out, what the yield penalty is for delayed planting on soybeans. Um, every year or week, we get the days plantable based on NAS. Then we can look at you know size of fields and equipment sizes and have those as kind of feeders into a, an Excel spread. I mean, we could probably build this relatively simply you know, to get a big picture in Excel and then say, well, if I add another planter in and it costs me $60,000 for this used planter that, or whatever that cost might be, if you get a brand new one and how much, how many based on 20 or maybe 15 plantable days or in a, in May in Wisconsin or maybe five in Ohio based on your weather you kind of run into in the spring in yeah, Ohio. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can do those calculations and see if it's paid off. And I've actually given talks similar to this where I had a farmer just kind of back of the envelope, figure that out. And he goes, I could pay a planter off in five years if I, you know, by do just by doing this. So I, I think it's, you can do it. We have the data to do it. We just haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Good question. It would be interesting to see that, see those um, results there. So kind of bouncing back to agronomy now. So looking at uh, planting dates, uh, I guess specifically for soybean, can you touch on any crop protection decisions in terms of in furrow treatments or seed treatments um, based on your planting date? Sure, so there's a, there's a few caveats here. I, I know we keep saying caveats a lot, but I think number one, you have to understand the, the, the history of your field. Obviously, if we start pushing farmers into earlier planting, um, there those farmers that have a higher risk of sun death syndrome, that should push farmers into picking one of those, um, you know, pairing genetic resistance slash tolerance to SDS with a couple of those effective modes of action for managing sun death syndrome. That should be a no brainer. I think the plant pathologists and agronomists have kind of shown that, um, that those work pretty effectively. And then one of the other challenges we're starting to come into is I think we're starting to see phytophthora related issues where we're seeing a breakdown of some of the resistance genes and really being able to do a really good job if we can't select resistant genes um, just because of availability or they're no longer effective, pairing that with an effective seed treatment for phytophthora is pretty key. So I think those are really good. The two areas that I'd be looking at understanding um, the phytophthora uh, in your area, because I know Ohio is really, and forgive me if I'm wrong here, um, Laura, but I mean, that's pretty, that's the hotbed of phytophthora, I think. We, we always see issues in Ohio first and the kind of, that's kind of our indicator state, if you will. Um, but I looked at Wisconsin, you know, Wisconsin, we had, I want to say we had roughly 20% of the varieties that are entered in our variety trial didn't even have a phytophthora resistance gene in it. So I think farmers really need to pay attention to that and, and make sure you're planting those genetics that have multiple sources of genetic resistance. I think that's a key. And then pairing that with the seed treatments that are effective against both phytophthora and sun death syndrome. So that's probably a long answer, but that's what we see. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I'm going to bounce one to you, Spiros. Um, so in your, your model, um, do you incorporate information on last frost dates? We talked a lot about the planting part, planting decisions. Do you consider that, that back end as well? Uh, no, actually, it's very difficult to predict frost. 
And actually, what makes it more difficult is that uh, when, are, when are, are you going to actually do all these simulations? Most likely, you're going to do it several months before uh, harvest, uh, because you're going to do it before planting. So it's extremely difficult to incorporate that. Maybe you can, but there's going to be so much uncertainty. Uh, so I haven't even tried to do this. Mm -hmm. So I mean, another I know, oh, go ahead, Sean. I was gonna say, I know Spiros, I mean, we've, he's done some work and kind of modeled out like some risk of frost and some other papers. We kind of get a sense of when that minimal risk comes in. And I think, and I'll just use Wisconsin because it's, in, I, this is where I work. I think roughly it's after like May 5th or May 7th, that risk for frost is really, really low, like minuscule. But then three years ago, we had a significant frost event that came through at the end of May and that kind of blew that all up. So I think this cold goes back into this climate variation that we have to be aware of that we see more of these extreme events happening. And I do know that in our case where we had the biggest damage was actually in the no-till fields because these fields didn't warm up as quickly. So not saying we're trying to promote farmers to move away from no-till, but there's a lot of other caveats that come into play versus just the average of 30 years. Because, you know, what's the average of 30 years? Basically, the average of 30 extremes. Yeah. Yep. So in terms of the tool, um, is there a place farmers can put their own data and their own prices? Uh, yes, yes. Depending uh, what they want to optimize. Uh, for example, if they just want to optimize planting date, they want to see what the optimal planting date is. They just have to go and drop up into their field, just using Google Maps, and input some uh, field information, uh, like soil type, etc., and some management practices. Uh, and then, yes, the tool can. Uh, it's pretty uh, flexible and easy, like drop down menus or sliders. Uh, so it's very user friendly, yes. Awesome. And, and I'm going to throw in a plug for the work that uh, Laura and I and other soybean agronomists are leading in the North Central region. Funded by the North Central Soybean Research Program, or your checkoff dollars, is we're collecting all of this agronomic management data and yield data. It's called our, our data driven project. That um, this is all kind of feeding into these algorithms and building out better and more accurate tools. So. Um, feel free to contact Laura or whoever your state soybean agronomist is, whatever state you're in that are um, working on this, or you can just go to my web page, coolbean.info, find the data-driven project and upload it pretty easily. So, yeah, it's not, we're trying to make, not make it, it's very onerous, but, you know, the more data we get, the more accurate these, these models can be. Yep, yep, for sure. Yep, for sure. Send us your data if you have some. Contact us. So, Sean, you mentioned you're in a dairy state, so I have a dairy question too. Um, have you done any analysis similar to this to when to stop planting corn and harvest first cut alfalfa in a dairy system, or do you try to stay far away from alfalfa and you don't have an answer to this? The latter, but you know, yeah. I, I did grow up in a dairy farm. I did dairy milk farm. cows since I was 18, and there's a reason why I'm a soybean agronomist now because I I've never been kicked by a soybean plant yet, or you know, splattered by a, a, a dirty tail. So basically, what we've kind of seen in, in Wisconsin, and I don't know if you're specifically talking about in a dairy system, if you're going corn for grain or corn silage, but we typically see a lot of that management where farmers will take that first cutting of alfalfa off if it's a thin stand, and then go right in and plant corn. Um, again, a lot of those are focused more for corn for silage just because of the dairy state and the need. But I mean, corn for grain is still, it's hard to beat corn, you know, in, in some of these uh, relationships in these later plantings. Mm -hmm. So does sweeping relative maturity make a significant difference when priori prioritizing corn or beans? So some of the work that we've done kind of, sh of showing maturity group and in general, yes, you know, if you are unfamiliar with a new variety as it comes into the marketplace, generally a later maturity group bean for your region tends to yield higher or, you know, but 
with that caveat being said, we run this analysis every year and in Wisconsin because we're trying to promote, you know, either cover crops or getting winter wheat in the system or, you know, other types of, um, you know, in a forage production system, getting as planted as early as possible. We see varieties that are our whole maturity group earlier yield the same as late. And what I mean by that, let's just use the Arlington location because we've been talking about that. You know, the maximum maturity group for yield there is roughly a 2.5. We'll get one fives yield the same as a two five. And then we can get those beans out seven to 10 days earlier in a given year. And it gives us a week to 10 days more growth in the fall for some of these cover crops. And that's huge. And many of you who have worked in cover crops understand seven to 10 days in the fall is huge in terms of accumulating biomass and getting a good st stand so that we can get to that threshold of 5,000 pounds per acre to be able to have that effect on weed competition. Mm -hmm. So how does this type of research or other research interface with uh, crop insurance approved practices? Good point. So I think the first thing is we'll first talk about NA or the RMA. So as part of the Science for Success team, we are able to use this information, this data to actually push uh, RMA to have an earlier um, replant um, map for farmers. So we've been able to gain anywhere from 10 days to 30 days to push that coverage up. Also by being able to get this information, it allows us to collect the data that we can work with RMA uh, to be able to change some of these recommendations or BMPs. And I know, I don't know about how you work in uh, Ohio there, Laura, but I would say yearly I am writing letters for farmers pushing the envelope to say this is an approved practice for crop insurance reasons so they will get coverage and i think this allows us then if we collect this data and get this information we can we can adjust our bmp so we don't have to write letters for specific farmers these just become part of rma and become best management practices so i think that's something we're working on and we're continue to strive and push and i'd like to give rma credit They've been very aggressive the last two years in terms of making some wholesale changes to their crop insurance. So it's been it's been good. Yeah, important work and important work to continue that relationship for sure. Uh, yeah. So Sean, I don't know if you've done works on seed priming um, or not, but uh, can you speak to to seed priming and that role in early planting? Yeah, I mean we see. I come from a vegetable state. Um, by that I mean there's a lot of carrots and celery and other vegetable crops. Will they do some seed priming? I, I have not done it on soybean. Um, I think that might be kind of a challenge but based on the equipment. I mean, maybe throw an air seeder and have to put some thought into it. Um, specifically, if you're using treated seed, I don't know how that would that it, would it. it intersect i'd have to think about that one so the answer is no i haven't done it specifically on soybean i can see sean's wheels are turning and you guys are giving a lot of um, new idea generation and i'll have to maybe not pick up my phone the next few weeks because i'll have a lot more research to do in ohio when sean convinces me to do it as well so um i think that addressed the majority of uh the questions um, I want to again thank everyone for joining us today for the webinar and thank you um, Spiros and Sean both for your time and sharing your research and as a reminder uh, the recording will be made available uh, and sent to all of the attendees soon and uh, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you everybody.